When it comes to the list of foods we're supposed to avoid as thyroid thrivers, gluten tops the list. Why is that? What's the deal? Today, I'm featuring a special guest, Whitney Morgan, to tell us about your thyroid on gluten and why it can be a problematic food for so many of us. We'll also be exploring some of the new testing that's available around gluten, as well as tips for going gluten-free and pitfalls to avoid. It's going to be a great and super informative show that's going to help you understand the gluten thyroid connection. So stick around. Hello, thyroid drivers. Welcome back to another episode of Thyroid Healthy Bites, a weekly podcast dedicated to helping you live well and eat well so you can feel well. I'm Ginny Mahar, your host and the face behind the apron at hypothyroidchef.com. All right, Thyroid Thrivers, I'm so excited to be here for this episode of Thyroid Healthy Bites. I have a special guest today. I'm here with Whitney Morgan of Morgan Nutrition, and we're going to be talking about your thyroid on gluten. So this is going to be a really juicy one. This is a hot topic and one that I know all of you Thyroid Thrivers who have looked into thyroid healthy eating at all, have probably heard something about gluten and should we be avoiding it? What's the deal? Why is this such a big deal for thyroid thrivers? So welcome, Whitney. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Really excited. Thanks for having me. Sure. It's great to connect and I'm happy to connect you with uh, this community because we're all hungry to learn about this and to understand more about why this is a big deal. So before we get into the interview, um, I'd like to tell everybody a little bit more about you. Whitney Morgan is the founder of Morgan Nutrition, as I mentioned, and the creator of the Thyroid Reboot Method. She's helped dozens of women with chronic Hashimoto's and other autoimmune conditions bust through the obstacles, keeping them from the life they want by uncovering the root causes of their symptoms and eliminating their unique triggers. Whitney is a licensed acupuncturist, a functional nutritionist, and a certified gluten-free health coach. In addition to her private practice, she serves as a clinical advisor and instructor for the Association of Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioners. I read your bio and I was so like, oh my gosh, (laughs) this woman's got some credentials. I mean, I didn't know that about uh, your association with the, you know, the Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Practitioners. I've worked with several FDNPs. It's just an awesome... um, you know, area of expertise or specialty for those of us looking to, you know, not just learn about nutrition and thyroid from a functional standpoint, but also to be able to do some testing. So that's a very cool. Which is so critical for women with thyroid issues to get that data, right. That's unique to us. Really important. Yes. And I think so many of us get caught on that hurdle of, oh, I want to learn more about what's going on with me. I want to get some of these tests I've learned about, but my conventional MD isn't going to do it, doesn't know what they are, you know, has refused to do them. You don't necessarily have to go through your doctor. You know, you can go through someone like an FDNP who, who can help you understand which tests might be great for you to start with and even help you interpret the results. Is that correct? Absolutely. And that's, as a clinical advisor, that's what I do. That's my main role is helping other FDN practitioners kind of correlate all of the test data, you know, and analyze the case as a whole and plot the best way forward. So I have the benefit of not just looking at my clients and and their lab results, but getting to see a wide array of different client cases from all of my FDN colleagues. So really honored to be able to do that. It's, It's a nice perspective to have as a clinician. Oh yeah. I bet that's fascinating to be mm-hmm. able to see that much data. Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah. Particularly if you're a nerd. <laughs> so it's, it's fun. <laughs> My hand is up. Um, Absolutely. All right. So 
Can you tell us a little bit about your story and background? I mean, we've heard about, you know, your professional background, but how did you get into this? What inspired you to take this path? Yeah, I guess it boils down to desperation and hopelessness. Um, That's probably the first thing that inspired me. I, um, it was 1997 when I was diagnosed with my first autoimmune disease. And I come from a very traditional medical background. Practically everyone in my family is a doctor or a nurse or something. So in my household, it's like there is a pill for everything and doctors have the answer for everything. So not only do you go to your doctor, but you go to the specialist, right? The, the creme de la creme of, of docs. So I was definitely walking that traditional path. Um, didn't get much help with psoriasis. That was my first autoimmune disease. I got a lot of creams and steroids and things like that. Then by the time 2010 rolled around, I had collected three more autoimmune diseases. So now I'm multiple specialists and different things going on, right? And And your body's obviously like red alert, something's wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the wheels have obviously fallen off the bus, right? I mean, everything's breaking down. And the only real continuity between different doctors that I would see is that, you know, practically every single one of them would say, well, we don't really know why this happens, you know, um, because that's always the question. Why is this happening to me? What is causing this? What can I do? Well, we don't really know, right? Um, There's never, there was never really an answer. So it was just, okay, this, this is just your luck, right? You you drew the short straw, sorry. And, um, and this is the way it's going to be. And then one day um, I was in a specialist office and this was getting treated or getting a consult for another autoimmune disease disease that I was diagnosed with, interstitial cystitis, extraordinarily painful urinary disease. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, this isn't going to kill you, but you'll die with it and it's going to get worse. Uh, We can try and manage the pain, but you should probably join a support group. And I just left that office knowing, okay, that's it, that I cannot accept that. That is not my future. There has to be something else. I didn't know what I was moving towards, but I knew what I was moving away from. And it was clear to me at that point that, yeah, he's right. There's nothing that that he has to offer me. And, And in his world, nothing could be done and that's okay. But I couldn't, I couldn't accept it. So that's when I started jumping down the rabbit hole of holistic medicine, naturopathy, Chinese medicine, um, homeopathy, all kinds of things, right? I mean, I'm just like trying to throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. And then um, Chinese medicine really grabbed me. And that was the first time that I felt like I got grounded in some other path forward. So I went to acupuncture school. And then when I graduated from acupuncture school, I found functional diagnostic nutrition, which was a great compliment because in my brain, acupuncture or Chinese medicine is kind of the original functional medicine, right? It's all about root cause. And then here was this more modern Western, you know, discipline of functional nutrition that was also based on let's find the underlying root cause. The diagnosis doesn't really matter. We need to find out what are the dominoes that were lined up that something tipped it over that, that allowed this cascade to happen? We need to reverse engineer. And that's all about getting to what are the root triggers underneath. And then of course you have all the lab work and the data. So in Chinese medicine, I'm doing tongues and pulses and all of that stuff. And then in functional diagnostic nutrition, I'm getting hardcore data on paper. Um, It's just a really nice blend. And as I learned all these things over like a six year journey, I was just applying everything to myself. Um, And I started getting better. Yeah, that's right. N equals one experiment. And what, what really just kind of set it for me and, and made me realize, yeah, this, this is it. This is going to work is when my interstitial cystitis went away which is unheard of. That is absolutely unheard of. There is no cure. Um, So, I mean, I imagine that a traditional MD would say, oh, you're just in remission. But I've been in remission for, um, I mean, my God, almost a decade now. So 
so to me, it's not even in my body. I, I no longer have it. It's gone, right? That's um, amazing. Congratulations. It is amazing. And, Thank you. you know, I'm sorry for everything you've been through, but it's like these silver linings of mm-hmm. our health challenges are that they really press us to learn more about our bodies yes. and how they work and to take the reins of our health. So what an awesome story. Absolutely. And and also the, the biggest silver lining for me, Jenny, is that, yeah, that was a rough journey for over a long period of time. And there was a lot of, you know, hopelessness for me involved in that journey. And, and so I, I understand when clients come to me and they start talking about that hopelessness and feeling defeated and feeling abandoned and, you know, things like that. But my journey now has taught me that it doesn't have to be that way. There is something different. And I am so glad that I went through all that now. I'm thankful for that long journey because now, I mean, I never thought I would be doing this. Sure. You know, if I was going to go into medicine, I was going to go to med school, not, not what I'm doing now. And um, so it completely changed my life, completely changed my career and my passion and my mission. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Well, I can definitely relate to that. And I'm sure many of the listeners can too. I'm currently a functional medicine health coach candidate and I'm loving it. And I get that question from people sometimes, what's functional medicine? I've never heard of that. And, you know, it's hard to talk about um, like the, you mentioned, you know, Chinese medicine, naturopathy, functional medicine, you know. I think the thing that those things have in common, and I'd love to get your take on this too, but I call it whole health oriented medicine. They look at the body as a whole. And I think functional medicine in particular is really rooted in um, sort of the conventional model, you know, looking to be evidence-based, looking to be legitimized by the conventional medical community so that maybe someday this stuff will be covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. And um, it really, functional medicine really seems to excel with chronic health conditions, which is what almost all of us thyroid thrivers are dealing with is a chronic health issue or an autoimmune condition, which is a chronic disease. And um, that's where a lot of us feel frustrated in the conventional medical realm and have turned to these whole health oriented principles to reclaim our health. So did I kind of, yeah, your, your, uh, um, take on that is definitely more, you know, learned. So did I get that right? Or yeah, I think you get that. You've got that exactly right. And for, for the people who are listening, who want to learn more about, Hey, what's the difference between functional medicine and conventional medicine? Um, the disease delusion by Jeffrey Bland. Oh, a book. amazing. Great book. And, and a super easy read and you're able to walk away and really see the difference. And it's not that one is better than the other. These are two different models and conventional medicine does what it does very well. Absolutely. And, and it's just like having tools in your toolbox. You know, you use pliers for one thing, you use a hammer for another, and you don't want to mix up what you're using them for. Right. That's the same way with conventional and functional medicine. Um, but they're best when they're used together because they both have, incredible strengths. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's dive in. Tell us about your thyroid on gluten. Can you give us the rundown (laughs) of like, what's the deal? Sure. So yeah, I usually get this question of, well, do I really have to be gluten-free? I don't, you know, I feel fine when I eat it or my doctor tested me, said I'm fine and you know, all kinds of stuff like that. Right. Or, hey, can I just have a little bit of gluten every now and then? Well, the reason why gluten is so problematic for the thyroid is the first thing is gluten causes a leaky gut in everybody. You don't have to be sensitive to it. Um, There's something about the gluten protein that stimulates an increase in an enzyme called zonulin within the gut. And when zonulin levels go up, those little tight junctions between the cells that line our gut they get dysregulated and they, they get stuck open, right? So you have all these little open gates throughout your gut lining and that lets 
partially digested proteins get through and, and other viruses and toxins and all kinds of things get through the gut lining that aren't supposed to, right? So because gluten causes a leaky gut, then it also itself gets through the gut lining. And once that happens, a couple of things um, can, can be the result of that, which the first is there is a lectin, a toxic lectin called wheat germaglutinin. It's part of the wheat protein. If it gets through the gut lining, it really can go anywhere in the body. And there's practically no tissue or organ that doesn't have a cell receptor that wheat germaglutinin can fit into. And the thyroid is one of those organs. So wheat germ travels through the bloodstream, goes to the thyroid, docks into those cell receptors. And because it doesn't belong there, when the immune system is just out doing its regular patrol, it looks, it sees that the, the wheat germ is stuck onto the thyroid. It says, hey, you don't belong there. Bang, 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 bang. And it goes after it. Well, because it's going after the wheat germ, the, thyroid, the surrounding thyroid tissue gets damaged in the process. And that's what we call autoimmunity by collateral damage, okay? So that's one way that, that gluten can cause Hashimoto's. The other problem is that part of the gluten protein looks very similar to your thyroid tissue. It's called molecular mimicry. So when the immune system is patrolling, it's not looking at all of the specifics of a protein, it's taking snapshots of the protein. And it's just patrolling and it's having to make decisions pretty quickly. So if part of that gluten protein looks a lot like part of that thyroid protein, the immune system can make a mistake and it tags the th that, th that piece of the thyroid protein as if it were gluten. So now every time it sees the thyroid, it goes, oh, you're gluten, you're a bad guy and it goes after it. So that's another way that gluten causes autoimmunity. So anyone with a thyroid issue is at a high risk of developing thyroid autoimmunity, for starters, and anyone who eats gluten is setting the stage for autoimmunity because of that increased gut permeability. So the problem with a little bit of gluten every now and then is that Gluten also causes an inflammatory cascade that can last up to six months. So if you're just having, okay, I'm going to have, you know, cake on my birthday. I'm going to have gluten at Christmas and at Thanksgiving. You're basically going to put yourself in a constant state of inflammation because those antibodies take about six months to clear the system. And as long as you've got elevated antibodies, you've got systemic inflammation. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. It's so clear. Um, what's your stance on gluten for thyroid patients then? I mean, you all, you, and you did kind of just explain mm -hmm. this as far as just, that's why we're supposed to, that's why so many, you know, nutrition experts recommend that we completely eliminate gluten yes. as thyroid patients. Yes. So are there any cases where you feel like it's okay for some people? Like personally, I have had, you know, some testing done recently. Um, I recently had a GI map, mm -hmm. which, which is, you know, just shows you all everything that's going on with your gut flora and all right. kinds of things. And I <clears throat> use the add on for zonulin, which is a marker for leaky gut. Right. And it was very, very low. And there was also, there's another, um, anti-gliadin. Yes. Thank yeah. you. That indicates like your body is reacting to gluten. Now Correct. I try to avoid gluten. Don't, you know, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not celiac and, you know, I, there's certainly times when I'm sure I'm exposed to gluten when eating out sure. or things like that. And I don't notice it. But for someone like me, who's been, you know, almost a hundred percent gluten-free for like several years and is not showing signs of things like leaky gut or celiac. I mean, is it okay then, or is it still going to trigger that inflammatory response that can last for six months? Yeah. Well, 
it doesn't matter how long you avoid gluten, gluten will always trigger that zonulin increase. So the reason why I, I'm just assuming that you've been very successful at avoiding gluten, and, the, and that's one of the reasons why your test results look the way they did, right? Because you have been avoiding it. So of course your anti-gliadin antibodies weren't elevated because it's not, it's not coming into the gut. And your zonulin is normal um, because you're not exposed to gluten. And the only other thing that triggers zonulin is um, endotoxins from some pathogenic bacteria. So the fact that your zonulin is normal tells me, okay, you don't have a lot of endotoxins, good, and you're avoiding gluten, great. But that doesn't mean that it's okay for you to eat gluten, right? Because the minute you do, the zonulin is going to go up. It doesn't really matter whether or not you're gluten sensitive. And once that goes up, your gut gets leaky, and then you're kind of vulnerable to a lot of different things happening, right? Um, and the thing about gluten is that it's one of the only foods we know of to which the immune system creates what are called memory B cells, which means it kind of is hardwired. So Unlike other foods, let's say if you have, I don't know, a reaction to cinnamon and ginger and carrots, right? Okay, well, maybe you just need to avoid those foods. We're going to heal and seal your gut. We're going to get everything, you know, back to a nice, healthy baseline. Then we can reintroduce those foods. And chances are, that's going to be totally fine because those foods are inherently healthy. They don't damage the gut lining, right? And most people who are sensitive to a lot of different whole foods, that says more about their digestion and their leaky gut than anything else. Okay. Okay. So yeah, healing and sealing, great. Reintroduce those things. But gluten is different because it has that permanent um, encoding into your immune system. The immune system's never going to forget it. So once it's identified it as a bad guy, it's always going to react to it. Right. So it doesn't matter how much you heal and seal the gut or how much you support your digestion. But because I'm a nerd and I like data, what I would say to you is, well, first, you want to run the wheat zoomer, which is, I think, hands down the best gluten sensitivity test out there that we have right now that's available. OK, run something like that. The wheat and zoomer. It's called the wheat zoomer. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's fantastic. So it will tell us the state of your gut. Is it leaky? Is it not leaky? And it will show us how your immune system is reacting to almost every single part of the wheat protein. Okay. okay. So if you've been successful at avoiding it, it should be perfect. Everything in the green, right? Then I would say to you, okay, now challenge it. Have a little wheat over the next you know, couple of months here and there, don't go hog wild crazy because you might make yourself feel really crappy, but you know, enough exposure consistently so that your immune system comes into contact with it. Then let's retest you and let's see how your immune system feels about that. And if everything is still in the green, fine, you are a unicorn. You, you drew that lucky golden ticket, right? But most people that I work with, that is just not the case. Mm -hmm. oh. They're going to, they're going to show up with a lot of elevated antibodies, which is an indicator that the immune system is now on high alert. It's hypervigilant. There's a lot of inflammation going on. And if you have autoimmune disease already, it's probably progressing. Okay. All okay. right. Thank you so much for yeah. explaining that, you know, because I mean, I've interviewed a lot of nutrition experts and talked about gluten. I've researched a lot of this myself and it's like, maybe it's just the foodie in me where I'm always like, but, 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 but. there's gotta be, you know, yeah. <laughs> really no gluten ever. So I, I hear what you're saying though, that, you know, everybody's body is obviously we're all bio individual. Yes. And there is a possibility. And with a lot of foods, you can heal to the point of being able to reintroduce, mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing about like the autoimmune protocol diet or other elimination diets, right. That is sometimes misunderstood is that elimination phase is not meant to be forever. The goal is not to have the most restrictive diet. The goal is to let your body heal. Yeah. And then be able to reintroduce so you can have dietary diversity. 
Exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, gluten is one of those things that is, it's the number one recommendation you hear for thyroid patients. And, um, I appreciate your take on it because, you know, some experts are like, Mm, you probably shouldn't, you might not be reactive to it. It depends on you. And there are other as- experts who, you know, like you, more like you who are more so saying, absolutely not. This really should not be a part of your diet. That is the yeah. most prudent thing to do for your health, especially if you're dealing with autoimmunity. Absolutely. And and what further complicates things too in the thyroid world, and I don't know if, if you see this with women that, that you work with, but you know, so many women are diagnosed with hypothyroidism and they'll say, well, you know, I don't have Hashimoto's. I just have hypothyroidism. But part of the reason why that's their diagnosis is because they've never had their antibodies checked. Right. Right. So it's like, well, actually it just means that you have this blind spot. So we really do need to get the right data. Um, Which leads me to another complication, which is the, the women who come to me and say, my doc tested me for gluten issues and I don't have them. And I say, well, what test did you get? Can I see it? And usually it's a celiac panel. Well, that's a completely different animal. So the celiac panel isn't really testing how your immune system is responding to all the different peptides of gluten. It's looking for indications of gut damage and villus atrophy right? That autoimmune process that's going on in the gut lining. So you can have a negative celiac panel and I run a wheat zoomer on you and it lights up like a Christmas tree because you're, you're really gluten sensitive. You just don't have celiac disease, Mm -hmm. right? But so there's that confusion. They're conflating these two things that are, that are actually very, very different. And again, that's not like a diss on the medical community because that's really the only test that most docs are familiar with, that they have access to, that insurance is going to cover. It's a celiac panel, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't rule out gluten sensitivity. It just rules out celiac disease. Yeah. Which seems like it really just um, tags those who are in like a more extreme health situation with gluten, with wheat. And I know back when I was eating, you know, everything before I I had Hashimoto's and all of that, I was absolutely reacting to gluten. I think I reacted to it my whole life, looking back at my childhood. And um, I've felt so much better since Mm -hmm. Uh, reducing and eventually eliminating it in my life and have always tested negative for celiac Yeah, in spite of going, but I see the evidence. I would get these like red um, flaky patches on my face, uh, bloated, digestive issues. I get really backed up. Like, yeah, I, I can see the correlation, but this piece of paper isn't really validating that. And, and that is a great, um, you know, thing for the listeners to kind of be aware of is if you've tested negative for celiac, it does not necessarily mean that you are not sensitive to gluten. Right. Because the celiac disease is, you think of it in terms of Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's is tissue destruction of the thyroid, right? Excessive tissue destruction of the thyroid to the point where thyroid function is damaged and your hormone levels kind of, you know, tank. Well, celiac disease is tissue destruction of the villi and the microvilli of the gut lining. And if you've seen any pictures of that, or you've heard Tom O'Brien talk, you know, the, the villi and the microvilli, that's like, you know, little shag carpet, right? And they're like these little fingers, and that's how we absorb nutrients. Well, in someone who has full-blown celiac disease, it's just slick, right? It's like, it's like the luge at wow. the Olympics, right? There's nothing there. And that's what that celiac panel is designed to identify. Oh it's gosh. the localized reaction to gluten at the gut lining. It's not designed for anything else. Okay. What a vivid visual. I, I totally can see that. I get that. That's really helpful to understand. Okay. Um, you mentioned the, was it the wheat zoomer test? Yeah. Yeah. Is, are there other tests that you recommend for gluten sensitivity or other related issues? I know we just kind of covered celiac sure. testing. 
Are, is there anything else we need to cover in terms of testing for the listeners? Yeah, there are two. There are two tests that that I that I would say are are worth the money, worth the investment. Um, one is made by Cyrex Labs, and it's called the Cyrex Array Three. The other is from Vibrant Wellness Labs, and that's the Wheat Zoomer. The reason why I prefer the Wheat Zoomer is because it has an intestinal permeability panel inside of it. So we get to see your leaky gut and the Cyrex test does not have that. It also tests for of the um, peptides of gluten and wheat. So it has more diverse testing markers than the Cyrex. So it's more a bit more comprehensive and it's cheaper. So it just kind of checks all those boxes, right? It's just it's just the better test. All right, um, great to know. And what I would avoid doing is, like you know, you go on Instagram or you go on Facebook, and you can like get the ever Everly Well and all those kinds of different food sensitivity panels out there. And um, sometimes people use things like that. That hey, I got a ninety nine dollar special. They'll use a test like that to find out whether or not they have a gluten sensitivity, but. The problem with those tests is that usually they're only looking at a couple of things. They're looking at the whole wheat protein. And if you're lucky, they're looking at the whole gluten protein, but they're not breaking down those proteins into their smaller parts. And the way I describe this to clients is imagine you've got a puzzle, right? And, and when all when the puzzle pieces are all put together, you can see the picture, you know what it is, and it's a big grain of wheat. Okay. Well, that whole puzzle is a very specific antigen to the immune system. It's very unique when it's all put together. When you break it apart, and now you've got a box full of puzzle pieces, each one of those puzzle pieces is itself a unique antigen that presents to the immune system. So it takes a completely different antibody. So you can test negative to the whole food, that big puzzle, but you can be testing positive and highly reactive to the puzzle pieces. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's what's called peptide-based testing. Mm -hmm. And that's what the wheat zoomer is. So the peptides trump the whole food every single time. And I see it all the time. I see people testing negative to corn. And then I run a corn zoomer on them. And it just lights up. Okay. Right? So you can get a lot of misinformation when you're just relying on whole food testing. Are there other zoomers? Like, is there a dairy yeah. zoomer? And yes, a okay. yes. All right. Yeah, that's what's so fantastic because as you know, probably, right, gluten cross reacts with other foods. So if your immune system has been gluten sensitive for a while and it's made a mistake and it's mistaken cow dairy for gluten or corn for gluten or rice for gluten, now every time you eat those foods, your body behaves and reacts as if you're consuming gluten. So yeah, now, now Vibrant has zoomers for those individual foods. So I can, I can run a corn zoomer, a dairy zoomer, um, and it doesn't have a separate rice zoomer, but it has a grain zoomer, which looks at a variety of different grains broken down into their constituent little peptide pieces. Oh, okay. right? So you get a lot more data. And it's very valuable. Sensitivity testing does not do that, correct? No, that the standard food sensitivity testing is like your basic IgG testing. You might do a finger prick and that's looking at like some are like 96 foods, 160 foods, right? That's all whole food. So, you know, they test for corn, they test for wheat, they, but it's the whole food antigen. And like I said earlier, when you're reactive to a lot of different whole foods, that really says more about your digestion and leaky gut, because in theory, your immune system in your blood should never come into contact with a whole food protein. That should always stay inside the gut lining, right? So it's very easy for your immune system to have never encountered the whole food antigen, yet to have encountered the little pieces of that whole food mm -hmm. that get through. And oh. that's what it reacts to. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. Okay. So what are your tips for anyone who is ready to go gluten-free 
or trying and struggling yes. Fail yes. to go gluten free. Yeah. Um, gluten free. I, I tend to be someone who, who likes to run towards something instead of away from something, right? So when I point people to um, resources for going gluten-free, I usually point them towards things like the paleo diet, the primal diet, the body ecology diet, right? Certain diets that are healthier than what they're already eating, right? Um, they're designed to remove a lot of inflammatory foods. And they're just naturally gluten free mm -hmm. because emotionally gluten is one of wheat and gluten is one of those foods where there's a lot of emotional, social connection around that. And it can be really difficult and um, almost like a grieving process to go through um, getting rid of gluten. People can wind up being depressed and feeling isolated from friends and family. And so sometimes it's easier to give them a structure that's already in place with menu plans and right and and tips on shopping for you know stocking your pantry and what to get rid of so it's not really focused exclusively on gluten free um, but gluten free is part of it mm -hmm. um, that's my probably the best tip because i think it makes the transition easier that way absolutely i if people yeah. just go gluten free they wind up just looking for gluten-free alternatives to the foods they're already eating, mm -hmm. swapping one thing for another. And oftentimes those gluten-free versions are loaded with a bunch of really bad things, a lot more sugar, a lot more partially hydrogenated oils and trans fats, and then loaded with corn and rice and dairy and <laughs> right other things that actually might not be good for their body. So, or yeah, even, you know, some of the like, pay, you know, gluten free breads that are paleo and things, it's like even things like tapioca starch and all those starches mm -hmm. can be kind of hard to digest. I mean, and I think I always say we live in a, a really good time to be gluten free because yes. there's so many options. You know, I think about people who used to have celiac and there was just nothing out there for them. Yeah. And, you know, I occasionally use gluten-free flour because it enables me to do things like make cupcakes for my son that I can have one yeah. of, or, yeah. you know, if he's having pancakes or requested chocolate chip cookies, there's no way I'm not going to have one. So I'll use the gluten-free flour. You know what yes. I mean? Give to people that wiggle room, Mm -hmm. And enables us to have a little bit more normalcy, which is important because food is emotional. It isn't just yeah. fuel, it's connection, it's information, it's emotional, it's all those things. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, those dietary templates, I always say they give us a common language and they make yes. it through recipe search too. So oh, yeah. all my recipes are gluten-free and dairy-free as a baseline. The vast majority are also paleo, which means yeah. grain-free, um, refined sugar-free, you know, and then uh, many of them are also autoimmune protocol elimination yeah, yeah. phase compliant, which means, you know, night, in addition to all the other paleo stuff, egg-free, nut-free, nightshade-free, seed, yeah. free, all that stuff. So it just helps to be able to point people towards, you know, these, um, dietary templates, mm -hmm. but yeah, eventually, you know, the goal I feel for thyroid drivers is always finding like, what does my particular body need? Right. What are my unique sensitivities and things like that? But, um, yeah. And that's where that testing comes in to get the data that's specific for you. Um, that's important because even if you're eating nothing but whole healthy foods, some of those healthy foods might not be good for your immune system, right? Um, and, then, and so the other tip I have is pretty, pretty simple. Stick to the perimeter of the grocery store. I mean, really just knocking out all those processed foods and sticking to the whole vegetables, the whole fruits, the, the lean or, or, you know, just the animal proteins, the eggs, um, the, the raw cheeses, if you can handle it, um, particularly goat and sheep, some people can handle that when they can't handle the cow dairy. Um, but that, those things are on the perimeter. 
right? Everything in the middle is that's kind of like birthday time. That's that's <laughs> Christmas time. That's that's sure. when you're getting a little wild and crazy, you know, and I just try and stick to the outside. Um, and the other thing is prepare most of your food at home. Learn, learn to enjoy cooking, learn, learn a way that it works for you. I'm not a, I'm not a person who really, I'm not a foodie. I, I, I don't like spending a lot of time in the kitchen, but I've gotten really good at making delicious things in 15 or 20 minutes. And now I just do it without even thinking. It's just the normal thing. I used in my former life, I used to go out to dinner three or four times a week. Now it's like, maybe once every few weeks, I might go to a restaurant, you know, and just that change alone has so many health benefits. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I mean, good health doesn't come in a box no. or a bag or a bar. <laughs> no, no. And it doesn't come in a five-star restaurant either. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. no matter how good it looks on the plate. <laughs> much as we love to indulge in those. Yes. Yes. Okay. Are there any other common mistakes people make when going gluten-free that we didn't cover yet? Yeah. A couple of things. Um, Most folks know enough to, to look for that certified gluten-free label, right? And that's good. You should always, if you're purchasing anything in a bag or a box or whatever, it should be certified gluten-free. Um, but gluten-free has become quite the buzzword. So there's a difference between a label saying gluten-free and it being certified gluten-free. And the labeling laws around that are very different. So it can have gluten-free on the label and still be completely contaminated with gluten. It just won't have any you know, obvious gluten-containing ingredients, but it's still contaminated. So get good at reading those labels, look for the certified gluten-free and then look for the fine print because you can also pick up a product that has says certified gluten-free. And then in the fine print, it'll say processed in a facility that also processes wheat, dairy, soy, corn, right? So if you really want to be as diligent as possible, you want to make sure that fine print isn't there. It should say, if it says something like processed in a facility that also processes nuts, okay, well, I can handle nuts. That's fine with me, but I'm never going to buy something that says also processed in a facility that processes wheat. I don't care if it's certified gluten-free. So that's another distinction when you're shopping. Yeah. Great label reading tips. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. The other thing is gluten-free doesn't just mean about your diet. It's also about your personal care products. So um, wheat and gluten show up in shampoos and conditioners and lip balm and makeup and hair dye and all kinds of places. So as you're making those switches in your pantry, also identify those manufacturers of personal care products that have as part of their mission to be a gluten-free line, right? And then when you run out of things, make the switch. And just make sure that everything you're using, all your makeup included, is manufactured according to to that kind of mission, right? And the good news is if you're buying gluten-free personal care products, they're usually far less toxic, too. They're getting rid of a lot of other chemicals. So it's a win-win situation. Okay, great to know. Whitney, thank you so much. This has been so enlightening. I'm so glad. It's been so much fun. I can talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> well, it's great to really dig in and kind of know yeah. out on, on the whys. I know, you know, yeah. for my healing journey, that's really helped me um, find that intrinsic motivation to stick with these changes is understanding yeah. how it works. Yeah. I so really appreciate you helping to um, clarify this for all of us and the testing, especially, you know, is really interesting to know about some of the testing options out there because, um, you know, it seems like the, uh, elimination and reintroduction test is still, you know, touted as the gold standard, but some of these tests, would you say, are they maybe even, do you still recommend like an elimination reintroduction as the gold standard? Or would you really go say, no, let's do one of these 
test to see how yeah. you're reacting to not just the the big puzzle of the gluten, but the little puzzle pieces, as you said. Yeah, I don't think elimination and reintroduction for gluten is effective. Okay. Um, and and it's really the data that shows me that because everyone's level of gluten sensitivity is different. And so I'll give you an example. Um, you know, for, for me, if I, if I actually sat down and mindfully ate a piece of gluten pizza, um, I would be waking up at two o'clock in the morning with a, a full blown panic attack and nerve pain all over my body. That's how, that's how it manifests for me. And I have celiac disease, oh. but I would never, ever have any digestive issues. I'm not going to have any diarrhea. I'm not going to have any gas, any bloating. It just doesn't affect me like that. Um, so it takes a certain dose of gluten to trigger what I identify as my gluten symptom, right? But you can have micro exposures, like from cross contamination in a kitchen in a restaurant, or you use the same cutting board as your husband and your husband just cut his French bread on it and wiped it, but there's still some stuff and you cut your cheese and now you got a little nanogram of gluten. That's a smaller dose. And it might not be enough dose to trigger the symptom that you associate with gluten sensitivity, but it's enough to trigger your immune system. It's enough to trigger leaky gut. It's enough to trigger these more silent things like autoimmune tissue destruction to go on, you know, and, until those symptoms start to emerge because the tissue destruction has gotten to be so intense. So I just say, don't rely on symptoms when it comes to gluten or what I call the mob bosses of the food world, gluten, dairy, corn, soy, don't rely on your symptoms. The to, mob bosses, I yeah, like. <laughs> yeah. Throw them all up in the lineup. They're the usual suspects, right? Uh -huh. So um, yeah, rely on testing for that. Okay. Um, because most people who think they're gluten-free aren't as gluten-free as they think they are when we run the labs, um, except for people who live in a gluten-free house. That if, if you want your best chance to being gluten-free, your whole, your whole house should be gluten-free. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my gold standard. Yeah. That's like, you know, the brass ring. If, if, if I could do the genie blink and gift all gluten sensitive people with any gift, it would be that their whole house would be free of gluten. Oh, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, thank you again. Yeah, Whitney. Um, you're welcome. You've got a thyroid lab test interpretation guide uh, yeah. for the listeners. Can you tell us a little bit about that freebie? Yeah, sure. So um, thyroid labs can be a little confusing for folks. And um, I think many women understand the frustration of going to their doctor and hearing everything's normal and, but yet they feel like crap. So um, this guide is really designed to teach you what you need to know about the different markers on a thyroid lab. What's the difference between a comprehensive thyroid lab and what I would call a very minimal screening, which is like TSH all by itself, which is what a lot of docs do. They just look at TSH and if that's normal, everything's good. So it's a little educational primer on what these different markers mean and why they should be included in your thyroid lab. And then it also goes over the differences between the standard reference ranges of conventional medicine as opposed to functional or optimal ranges. Um, and then beyond that, kind of give some guidance of, you know, how you can use your own thyroid labs as kind of a clue to figure out, okay, well, what might be underneath my thyroid issue? What are other areas of investigation that I might want to pursue in order to kind of reverse engineer this thyroid problem I have? Fantastic. Yeah. That sounds like great information. I will be sure and put the link in that, the link yeah. for that in the show notes for anyone listening. And um, yes, thank you, Whitney. It's been wonderful to connect and I really appreciate it. And I'm sure the listeners have learned a ton today as well. So thank you. You're welcome. It's been so much fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of Thyroid Healthy Bites. If you've enjoyed the show, please don't forget to like, subscribe, or leave a review. You taking that extra second to support the show really helps so much. So thank you in advance, and I'll see you next time.